So if you're not here for the lecture on Wednesday, I'm going to go through it. That way you can get your active listening notes. So we just read the article, I mean, the Declaration of Independence, right? So what kind of government did we have at the time? So we current, at the time of this, we had the Articles of Confederation. This is going to be the first government the United States has, um, which is going to be a confederal system, which we talked about uh, like two weeks ago. So this meant that the um, central government didn't really have a whole lot of power. All the regional or the state governments had lots of power. And whenever they wanted to come together and solve an issue, all 13 states had to approve of it before the um, federal government could really do anything. And as we talked about in class, it's very difficult to get an entire country all behind one idea. So what was the structure like? Again, the national government really didn't have any power because they needed to get it all from the states. So that meant the federal government could not actually even tax citizens directly. States could tax their citizens, but the federal government could not. So they could only request money from individual states and nothing required the states to actually give it. They also could not regulate trade, either international or interstate. They could not raise an army. So if we were to get attacked, individual states would basically be protecting themselves. There'd be no central army for the entire country. There was no executive branch or judicial branch. So there was no judicial review. If they passed a law, it would be state judges that are approving it and laws could vary widely across different state borders. Each state had one vote regardless of population. So again, all 13 had to come together to make any sort of change, even if the state was tiny like Rhode Island or really big. Not that Rhode Island had the smallest population, but they did at the time. Irrelevant. Um, so early problems. The US economy is really gonna suffer. They're gonna be very reliant on imports to be getting all their things. Um, the veterans who had just fought in this war couldn't really get paid by the federal government. So some states may have been paying more than other states. Uh, there was also very large war debt and there was no central government to be able to pay that all back. Continentals, which was a money used during the revolution, um, wasn't really backed by any gold or silver. And so it lost its value really quickly. So a lot of these veterans who were paid in this money couldn't really use it. And loans is really what buoyed the national government. So they were borrowing money from other places rather than being able to get it from their own citizens. So all of this is kind of going to lead to Shays Rebellion. It's going to be led by a revolutionary veteran, Daniel Shays in Mass, Massachusetts. <laughs> over taxes, and it really showed the need for stronger state and national governments because they weren't able to really calm down this rebellion like they should have. So this is going to lead to the Constitutional Convention in 1787. It's a meeting in Philadelphia, capital at the time, to try to fix the Articles of Confederation. Um, representatives are going to be sent from all states, and they basically agree this government is not working. We need a new constitution. Um, major issues we're going to go over are representation, slavery, and division. So in this new constitution, um, they do what they call a bicameral Congress, where there's two houses of Congress, the House and the Senate. The issue was the states with a, lot, a big population said we should have more representation in government because we have more people that live here. And the smaller states were saying, well, if we just give representation to only the big states, no one's going to care about our problems. Our problems are never going to get fixed. So they wanted equal representation. They want all the states to have the same representation. So they're going to have the great compromise um, where the House of Representatives is going to be based on your population. So you get a certain number of representatives for however big your population is. That's why California currently has the most seats in the House of Representatives and smaller states like Wyoming only have one. But the compromise for smaller states is that there's also the Senate where no matter how many people live in your state, 
you're going to get two senators per state. Slavery, a big thing they argued about, should they count as citizens? Southern states are saying, yes, they should count for citizens because they are um, people and this will give us more seats in the House of Representatives, but they didn't want to pay for taxes with them, right? Um, and this would increase their population figures in Congress. Um, and then Northern states said, no, they should not count um, because they don't get to vote. So why should they count towards your representation? So they do something called the three-fifths compromise where slaves are gonna be counted as three-fifths of the person. So if you had five slaves, that would count as three people towards your population count to raise how much uh, seats you had in the House of Representatives. Um, this would eventually get removed in from the Constitution in 1868. And then division. Not everyone in the country agreed with this Constitution. So the states had to be convinced this was an improvement. The Federalists are going to be the big supporters. Federal, like federal government, anti-federalists are going to oppose it. And there's the Federalist Papers, where it's going to be 85 essays that are published to try to convince the population why we need this new form of government. Um, if you have ever seen Hamilton, they talk a lot about this. Hamilton wrote a lot of those essays. And they had that great compromise where the Constitution is ratified. The national government moves their capital to Washington, D.C. So the Federalists prevail and the Constitution is ratified in June 1788 and goes into effect March of 1789 when George Washington becomes the first president. 